Well, thanks, Paul, for the introduction, and uh, hello to everybody tuning in today. And it's nice that uh, we have so many um, coming to see this presentation. It's also a great pleasure of mine to talk about uh, recent research going on um, with respect to Eurystheus salamanders in Central Texas. Um, and this, as I say, is recent work. It's also a little bit preliminary work. We're still working out some of the details, um, but I'm happy to be able to talk about it today. And I will also say that this is a collaborative effort. So while, while my name is on this front slide here, this is really the product of a collaboration with these fine people, um, all of whom has, have contributed greatly to this work in terms of field work, in terms of thinking about the ideas and analytical things. I wanna mention Pete, Paul, and Ruben in particular, who have gone out of their way to do some extensive sampling for this project. And without those guys, this could not have been done. Um, and Dr. Catherine Bell at the University of Nevada, Reno has helped with some of the analytical things, um, but everybody is really collaborating on this project, which is really a nice working environment here. Um, so as I say, we're interested in the salamanders of the genus Eurycia. I suspect that almost all of you who tuned in have some interest in the salamanders. I know that many of you know a lot more about these salamanders than I do. Um, but for the few of you who might not be familiar with the salamanders, recognize that they are groundwater alligate species, and there are 14 described species of these salamanders in Texas, and that includes both surface and subsurface forms, the subsurface forms being the sort of famous blind salamanders. Uh, many of those 14 species are of conservation concern. Several are listed as either threatened or endangered. And the other thing to know about these salamanders is that they've been the subject of a great deal of research in the past, um, particularly by David Hillis's group of colleagues, collaborators, um, even his intellectual descendants like Nate Bendick, for example, who have looked at these salamanders extensively um, and have revealed evidence of recent evolution in this group, um, including patterns of isolation among lineages or species, but also patterns of gene flow and admixture among these species. Um, so there's been a great deal of work on these Eurycia salamanders. Today, we're gonna focus on a subset of that taxonomic diversity, which are the central Texas salamanders that nominally belong to what's been called the Eurycia neotenes complex, which includes these three nominal species, the Texas salamander, that's Eurycia neotenes, um, Fernbank salamander, Eurycia latitans, and Cascade cavern salamander, Eurycia terophila. Um, and as I say, there's been a lot of work on this group, but this particular group of three taxa have had a sort of torturous history with respect to the taxonomy. Uh, after their original descriptions, they went through a period where revision of the systematics collapsed all of these species into a single species. Um, and then the three species were resurrected based on morphological and genetic data. Um, but there's still, despite that sort of history, there's still uncertainty about the boundaries uh, between these taxa and even actually, to be perfectly honest, the legitimacy of these species names. So this investigation that we're talking about today has the objectives of expanding the sampling for these taxa geographically and also thinking about the numbers of individuals that we're sampling per location and then surveying genomic variation across those samples with the ultimate goal, I think, here of identifying the management units and perhaps um, informing some of the decisions about taxonomy, perhaps. Um, so the specific questions for this project are these. The first question is about the organization of genetic variation geographically and taxonomically um, and measuring differentiation among populations or among lineages of salamanders. Um, and, and you may recognize by the phrasing of that question that I just gave that I'm, I'm gonna be agnostic about the nominal taxonomy during this talk until we get to some of the results and think about what's actually happening. Um, in fact, that's another way of saying that we're gonna treat those three nominal species as essentially hypotheses and think about how much the genetic variation corresponds to that nominal taxonomy. Uh, the second question then is whether there's been gene flow and if so, how connected are populations or lineages connected by that gene flow? And then lastly is that question about the genomic variation in relation to the nominal taxonomy. Okay, so here's the, here's the technical bits. Um, and we have to talk a little bit about how we generate the genomic data, and I will. Um, I'm gonna be brief in this section. Anybody who's 
super interested in the methods, I'd be more than happy to expand on those methods. Um, for those of you who are not terribly interested in molecular genomics details, here's a gratuitous picture of a salamander, one of Pete's fabulous pictures here to entertain you during this section. Um, so the sampling, the collection is um, tail clips that are just a portion of tail tissue that is removed from salamanders. Um, this includes new material, particularly that material collected by Pete uh, and Paul and Ruben, um, comprising 356 new samples. Um, Tom Devitt also graciously donated 10 DNA samples from preserved cave salamanders for us. We also have archive material from the Texas Memorial Museum, um, and then also uh, archive material here at Texas State from previous research on these uh, salamanders. So the, in the totality of the sampling is 516 individuals from the focal uh, Neotenes group from 31 localities. I'll show you the map of that in just a second here. Um, and then also as a basis of comparison, we included samples of the San Marcos salamander, Eurycia nana, uh, and then also um, individuals from four localities west of the focal group um, that are essentially, I think, um, equivalent to uh, Eurycia species two, if people are familiar with Tom Devitt and colleagues' recent science paper, um, these Western localities correspond to the undescribed species two in that paper. So in total, um, taking everything into account here, we have 618 individuals from 38 localities. And here's a map of those localities here in Central Texas. So for the Neotenes complex, we have these 31 sites listed here, if you're super interested in it. The numbers in parentheses are the numbers of individuals that were sampled at each of the localities, but they stretch from Fernbank site number 35 here in the northeastern portion of our sampling up here in Hayes County, all the way down to Government Canyon down here on the other side of San, San Antonio. Um, so that's the focal group of sampling for the three nominal species that we're focused on here. But as I say, we've also included uh, Nana from Spring Lake in, in San Marcos. And then also sites one through four are more Western localities sort of outside of our focal group, but they're here uh, to provide us a basis of comparison, if you will. So then in terms of generating the genomic data, we are using what is sort of a class of methods called genotyping by sequencing. And briefly what that means is that we extract DNA from those tail clips from the field and that genomic DNA is chopped up into fragments using restriction enzymes. We use two of them, uh, EcoR1 and MSC1, and then those fragments get Illumina adapters added to them. Those Illumina adapters are correspond to the Illumina sequencing platform that we're using here. So they include the Illumina priming sites. Um, and also we include what are called multiplex identifier uh, sequences, which are just eight, nine, or 10 base pairs in those adapters that are unique individual identifiers so that when we get our sequencing back from the genome facility, we know from which individual salamander those sequences came from. Then those fragments with those adapters on them are amplified with PCR, pooled across all the individuals, and then we sent them up to the genomic sequencing and analysis facility at UT Austin for Illumina sequencing on the NovaSeq platform. Uh, as I say, those are methods kind of in brief. If people are interested in the lab work part of this, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Once we get the sequences back from the genome facility, we have a lot of um, processing to do here, including assembling those sequences. And for Eurycia, we do not have a reference genome. So to get around that particular problem, we have to do some clustering of those sequence reads that we get back from the sequencing facility to look for homologous reads. Um, and we do that sort of clustering and take a consensus sequence from all of those clusters representing homologous regions in the genome. And we use those consensus sequences as a sort of fake or pseudo genome to which we align all the rest of the sequencing data from all the individuals. And then once we have that alignment, then we can look through it and look for variable nucleotide sites, which are the base working data here for population genetics. These are individual nucleotide sites in the data that are variable across individual salamanders. Um, they are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which actually is kind of a crappy name for them, uh, but they have this nice acronym, SNP, 
Um, and so the, sing the, the nucleotide sites that are variable are called SNPs. We have SNP loci at the end of this. Once we identify those variable sites, we do some filtering to ensure that we have sort of high quality data here. Um, we pick one SNP per homologous region in the genome just to minimize linkage to equilibrium in the data to try to sort of maximize independent information here. Um, we do a lot of filtering on sequence depth, the number of reads per locus per individual, um, the amount of missing data that's available or, or allowed, I should say, base quality, mapping quality, and a whole bunch of other sort of quality metrics that we're filtering on to make sure that the data set has not got problems in it. Um, and then once we have that filtered SNP data set, um, we'll use the, the variable sites as the basis for a variety of analyses. Um, at the core of our analytical framework, we're using this piece of software called Entropy, which is a hierarchical Bayesian algorithm that's similar to structure. For those of you population genetics fans out there that know the structure algorithm, this model is very similar to that model. Um, the user defines how many populations the model is looking for, so we can do that across any number of populations that we're looking at. And the model will estimate admixture proportions, um, genotypes, and population level allele frequencies, all of which can then be used in downstream analyses. And we'll, we'll take a look at the major patterns of variation using principal components analysis on the genotypes. We'll quantify differentiation using pairwise uh, FST values. We'll look at the admixture proportions from the clustering analysis itself with these bar plots. And then to tackle those questions at the beginning that I talked about with respect to connectivity and gene flow, we we'll use the tree mix algorithm, which is a demographic modeling approach, and I'll explain that a little bit later here. Um, and then we'll also ask questions about the organization of genetic variation using redundancy analysis or RDA, and I'll explain that too. Um, but that's allowing us to partition ge genomic variation uh, by various predictors. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Uh, let's take a look at what we've got here. So the results from sequencing were that we got 683 million sequence reads from all of those 618 salamanders, which is a, roughly about 1.1 million reads per individual. The filtered SNP set was 16,000 loci scattered around the genome with an average sequence depth of about 10 reads per locus per individual. And what did we actually find? So here's the first way to look at the data, which is just simply to do principal components analysis on the data. Um, so this is an ordination technique, which is not really quantifying anything, but just letting us look at the very multidimensional data set that we have here in a sort of simplified um, manner. So what we're looking at is every dot on this plot is an individual salamander. So all 16, 618, excuse me, salamanders are here and their position in this ordination space um, is determined by their genotypes at these 15,000 some SNP loci. So the genotypes are used to position them in this ordination space with individuals that are very close together being very similar in terms of their genotypes. Um, so principal component one, the first axis, the major axis of variation, explaining about 11% of the variation separates those Western localities from that undescribed species from the rest of what we're thinking about with the San Marcos salamander, Nan, I hear, taking up sort of an intermediate position along PC1. The second axis of variation, PC2, explaining about less than half of the variation from the first axis, is separating out the basically the individuals that belong in our Neotenes focal group here. And we'll take a closer look at what's happening there in just a second, but recognize that the major axis of variation in the full data set is between the Western localities and pretty much everybody else. However, while there is differentiation here, um, the levels of differentiation are relatively low. Um, the largest value of FST, which is our population genetics measure of differences in allele frequencies among localities or populations, is this comparison between the Pheasant and Spring sites site out west and Leah Springs, part of a cluster of sites that we have around the San Antonio area. And that FST is 0.12, um, which while not zero, um, is relatively low amounts of differentiation. And so because of that, um, 
what we're going to do for sort of the rest of most of our discussion of things is we're going to leave out the Western localities and Nana and focus instead on just our focal group here and see what's going on there. So let's turn our attention to the focal group. So here's another principal components analysis, but this one now is just the 500 or so individuals from the Neotenes group. And here, the first principal component, um, the major axis of differentiation separates out these uh, individuals colored in orange, which, which will, and we'll get this on the map in a second, but these are individuals that are basically in the Southwestern portion of our sampling from everybody else. Um, but again, as we saw in the first data set, the amount of genetic genomic differentiation that's happening here is um, relatively low. So the largest um, or the range of uh, pairwise F statistics that we're dealing with here um, range from 0 0.005, which is really, really low. That's between Jacobs Well and Fernbank, which are very close to each other in geography. Um, to the largest FST, which again involves Leah Springs, um, compared to some Leah Springs down in that San Antonio area to uh, the a site along the Devil's Backbone up here in the Hill Country, and that FST is also very low, uh, but is about five percent here. Okay, so then let's turn our attention to thinking about the clustering solution. So here's the results of the clustering analysis. We're thinking about admixture proportions. Um, and we have a couple of plots here. If you're not familiar with these plots, let me take you through it briefly here. Um, organized on the x-axis are all the individuals. And in fact, each one of the little bars in here, which you can barely see because there's 500 of them, <laughs> are representing individual salamanders. And the salamanders are um, organized in this plot by their sampling localities from basically west to East, so going from Osborne Spring in the west over here to Fern Bank Springs in the east. Um, and as I say, then every single individual is in here, and the colors on these bars represent the proportion of those individuals' genome that have ancestry with the clusters or the population. So in this first plot, where we ask the algorithm to find two clusters or two populations, the green and the orange clusters. Individuals that are not fully green or not fully orange have admixture evident in their genome. So these individuals, for example, um, have part of their genome has ancestry with the orange cluster, and then part of their genome has ancestry with the green cluster. And those guys represent a mix of different ancestries. Um, the same thing is happening here in the second panel, except here we've asked the algorithm to find three clusters. We can see this sort of purple cluster, and then the green cluster, and the orange cluster. Um, overall, though, we see patterns of a lot of admixture happening uh, in a lot of different localities. Um, and I've just pointed out a few of uh, sorry localities that might be interesting to people, like Cascade Cavern and Fern Bank, two of the places that salamanders are named after, both of which, interestingly, have some level of admixture in them, both of those places. And then I also highlighted here Honey Creek uh, and Preserve Cave. Again, thanks to Tom for letting us have those DNA samples. But these two sites have admixture with all three of the clusters. So there are individuals that have a portion of their genome with ancestry to the purple cluster, to the green cluster, and to the orange cluster as well. Lots of admixture. As a side note here, models of more clusters, four, five, et cetera, uh, were very poor fits for the data using Bayesian diagnostics and didn't increase any of our biological inferences that we're making here, so I'm not showing you any of those plots. Um, and in fact, I would argue that the clustering solution at three is probably the best description of the patterns of admixture that we see in these data. Okay. so. We should also think about this from an explicitly geographical perspective. So let's take these admixture proportions, but now do it at the level of localities, um, leaving out some of these localities that have very few individuals, um, just thinking about the localities that have more than five uh, individuals. And let's turn those admixture proportions into pi diagrams representing the, the proportions of ancestry and now putting them back on our map. So here's the map of that. And, and maybe this gives us a better sort of feel for the organization of genetic variation. There are populations in the West and the Western part of our sampling that have 100% ancestry with the green group, um, although there are also admixed populations out here as well. There are some populations like Government Canyon and nearby populations that have 100% ancestry with the orange group. 
there's these couple of populations out on the devil's backbone that have 100% ancestry with the purple group, but in fact, almost all the rest of, of the other localities have some level of admixture with two groups or again, back at Honey Creek and Preserve Cave here, admixture between all three of those groups. So bottom line here maybe is that there is a clustering that suggests that there are three um, groups here or three ancestral groups, um, but with a lot of admixture across a lot of our sampling localities. One of, one of the questions that this raises is whether that mix of ancestry that we see in these localities is a product of gene flow, the movement of individuals and their alleles between localities, or whether this is somehow a remnant or unsorted variation that might have been present in the ancestral population of all these salamanders. Um, and to explore that particular issue, we'll turn to some demographic modeling, actually a demographic modeling um, algorithm called TreeMix. Uh, and TreeMix, as I say, is a demographic modeling algorithm that's specifically designed to think about quantifying and identifying migration events. And in, in our sort of population genetics speak here, migration is synonymous with gene flow. So we're not sort of talking about, you know, birds migrating south for the winter or whatever. Migration is the movement of individuals and their alleles or their genes from one location to the next. So the tree, tree mix algorithm uses population level allele frequencies to think about identifying migration events. And the way it works is that we start first with this, which is the so-called drift tree, which is a representation, a dendogram, if you will, based on allele frequencies in all these localities. Again, we're restricting this to localities with decent sample sizes here. Um, so not all of the localities on this list, but most of them. And we're thinking about modeling the evolutionary relationships or the relatedness among in individual localities based on their allele frequency variation across all those 15,000 uh, loci that we've got in this particular data set. And, and this is just a straightforward model with no inference of migration on it. It's the starting point for this demographic inference. Um, but you can see a couple things. I've taken the liberty of coloring these um, localities a little bit like they appeared in that clustering solution that we just looked at. So this is the group of that sort of southwestern um, group of localities. This is the western group, and this is the more eastern or northeastern group. And we're also using uh, the San Marcos salamander. Uh, this is locality 36 down here to polarize this tree uh, to get us into this particular shape. So this is the drift tree. This is the estimated uh, relationships based on allele frequencies without any inference of migration. And then we can at this point, ask how much of the allele frequency variation do we explain with this topology and this drift tree? And in this case, we explain 83% of the variation. Then the model works next by adding migration events. So we add a migration event one at a time, picking the most likely migration event first. So here's a sort of hypothetical example. This is not the real data for a second. Um, but we imagine a migration event here, the, presumably the most likely one, where individuals move from locality nine and essentially joined the population at locality 19. This is a migration event. Notice that there's a, a, a head on that arrow indicating the directionality of that migration. And then once we've added this migration event, which also might require readjusting the topology of that tree, we ask how much of the variance explained increased compared to the previous drift only tree. And if the variation increased, then we keep that migration event and we continue on adding migration events until presumably we find a plateau in the variance explained. And so that's exactly what we've done in these analysis. So here's the sort of thinking about the proportion of the variance explained by models with from zero migration events, that's the drift tree that we were just looking at all the way up to 10 migration events. Um, so from zero to 10, a thousand replicates of each of those models. And what we're looking at here are bar, I'm sorry, box plots um, of the proportion of the variance explained. And I think if you sort of squint at this a little bit, you can see that in fact, the winner here is at M equals eight or eight migration events. It has the greatest explanatory power for explaining the variation of the frequencies among all those, those sites. So if we look at the uh, tree for eight migration events, we see this. So notice that first that the topology of the tree has changed a little bit. 
from what we saw in the drift tree, that's a reflection of the fact that we're readjusting the relationships based on our new knowledge of the migration events. But then we have all these eight migration events, which is really demonstrating a history of gene exchange uh, among many of these localities, right? Some of these uh, appear to be sort of contemporary or relatively recent gene flow events. So, for example, from uh, from a population over here by the devil's backbone, gene flow into locality number 31, which is Comel Springs Run 1, seems to be a relatively recent event. There's also historical gene flow from that same um, devil's backbone site into the ancestor of the Fernbank and Jacob Springs populations. Um, but taking a look at this and not worrying too much about the details, notice that the arrows are pointing in a variety of different directions, which is indicating that in fact, the history of these populations is a history that includes frequent gene exchange or gene flow among populations, rather than having that admixture variation that we saw in those bar plots simply be a reflection of ancestral polymorphism. There really seems to be a history of gene exchange among these salamanders. Okay, so then um, what about our last question and uh, thinking about the relationship between nominal taxonomy and the patterns of genomic variation? Um, this is essentially thinking about whether or not the nominal taxonomy of the three species is a good predictor of, of that genetic variation. Um, so what we're going to do here is use redundancy analysis, which is a canonical ordination technique for multivariate responses, and use the nominal taxonomy, so bin localities into these species to the best of our knowledge and ability. And <clears throat> I will say at this point, this was not done by me, but done by people who actually know much more about the salamanders than I do. Um, <clears throat> and then use those use those names as a categorical or factor predictor in the model to to do variance partitioning. So how much of the genomic variation is explained by the nominal taxonomy? And to do this properly, we should also account for the spatial dimensions here. So there could be, of course, patterns of variation that are simply due to the geographic distances among sampling localities. So to account or control for space, we'll use Moran's eigenvector mapping functions, which measure the spatial autocorrelation among all of our sampling sites. Um, but before we do that, we could just simply ask, how much variation do those spatial dimensions actually explain? So using the eigenvector mapping functions as predictors of the total genomic variation, we explain about 11.5%, which is relatively significant or substantial amount of genetic variation. And of course, this is reflecting this sort of what, what we think of here as maybe a northeast to southwest sort of dimensionality to the organization of genetic variation. So space just by itself is explaining quite a bit of the genomic variation, right? It's suggestive of a pattern of isolation by distance really going on here. Uh, but then if we think about the nominal taxonomy, so again, using the names of those three species as predictors for genomic DNA and controlling for space, we actually see something pretty weird here. So, so in this, so here's my little Venn diagram of variance partitioning. So, so all these numbers are the the amount of genomic variation that's attributable to these predictors, nominal taxonomy and space here. Um, notice that in this model, we're not explaining a giant chunk of the genetic variation. So the leftover variation that, that is unexplained is in fact 93% of the genomic variation. So we're not doing a very good job of predicting genomic variation. The nominal taxonomy explains about five and a half percent of the genomic variation, which is what Significant, not zero, but is not great. And weirdly, when we use space and account for space in this model, so controlling for space, um, the amount of variation for space actually declines. Remember, it was about 11.5% by itself, but now it declines for down to about 2%. That's really interesting, but that's indicative in these models of the fact that, in, that the nominal taxonomy, that categorical predictor, and space are very much collinear. Right. In other words, the, the spatial distribution of those nominal taxa matches the, the patterns of autocorrelation among our sampling localities. So there's this great collinearity, if you will, between taxonomy and space here. And that's a bit confusing, right? We can look more specifically at this pattern of isolation by distance, do the classic thing in population genetics, which is to plot the geographic pairwise distances among all of our sampling localities versus the pairwise 
FST is our measure of differentiation among all those lo localities. And we find out, in fact, the geographic distance is a significant predictor of the pairwise measures of differentiation. So a real pattern of isolation by distance with, with you know, localities that are closer together being more similar in terms of their allele frequencies than populations that are further apart having greater levels of differentiation here. Again, again that level of differentiation is low, but there's a clear geographic patterning to that variation that is significant. Well, that leaves us sort of unsatisfied, or at least me at least unsatisfied a little bit because, because the nominal taxonomy is really explaining very little, and it seems that most of the pattern is really an isolation by distance pattern. We could search around for other sorts of predictors that might be better descriptors of that genomic variation. And we did that. I won't belabor this except to show you one of them. Um, so we looked at a bunch of different predictors, things about the geology and the organization of the, the watersheds, for example. And it turns out that watershed as a categorical predictor, uh, hydrological units at the HUG-12 level, do a pretty decent job of explaining the genomic variation, explaining 13% of the genomic variation when we control for space. But here again, we're getting that weird pattern where space we know by itself explains about 11%. A lot of that explanatory power in space is getting sucked up by the watersheds because, in fact, here again, there's collinearity between the watersheds and space, uh, which is making it really difficult to untangle um, what's really driving the patterns of genetic variation in these salamanders. Okay, well, um, and maybe just to make that maybe a little bit less murky, we can go back to our pie diagrams add mixture proportions here and now add to this um, the watershed boundaries. And we notice that, in fact, many of the localities are in their own watersheds, for example, um, and we could actually do more. We could pop up our bar plots here and remember about the east, west to east, excuse me, dimensionality of the patterns of variation here. All that to say that there's isolation by distance with gene flow is really the answer with these salamanders. Okay, so what about our questions? The first one was how differentiated are populations? And I think the answer has to be that certainly within the Neotenes group, the pairwise estimates of FST are really low, um, with the maximum one being 5.5%. Um, it's sort of difficult to put that into context when we're just thinking about our salamanders. It'd be useful to compare to other organisms, for example, to sort of put that in perspective. Um, so let's do that, but but I'll have a warning here. Those of you who are super herpetology nerds, you have to avert your eyes because we're going to take a little invertebrate interlude here and look at some data courtesy of PhD student in our lab, Will Coleman, who's working on the blind Comel Springs dryopid beetles, Stigoparnis comelensis. He's got a similar data set, 43,000 SNPs in this case, and it turns out that the Comel Springs dryopid beetle is known from only three sites, and two of those sites, Comel Springs and Fernbank Springs, overlap with our sampling for the salamanders. And here, what Will has found with his comparable data set, the FST between Comel Springs and Fernbank Springs is 0.3, which I have to point out is a shorter distance than the greatest distance that we have in our salamander sampling, and that level of differentiation that we're seeing there is almost six times the maximum level of differentiation that we saw in the salamanders, right? So just hopefully that little invertebrate interlude didn't irritate anybody, <laughs> but it provides a foundation, a basis of comparison um, with what's going on with the salamanders. Um, and we do have evidence of three clusters here, although the levels of differentiation are low between them, and there are clear patterns of admixture, clear patterns of gene flow going on, um, as detected with our demographic modeling and some other things I'm not talking about here as well. And then lastly, the nominal taxonomy explains a pretty small 5% of the total genomic variation. We know that space by itself explains even more than that which really suggests that the organization of genetic variation within this complex of salamanders is really one of isolation by distance with gene flow. Um, that's really probably the best description of what's going on in this group of salamanders. So what about the question of management units? I think this is uh, tricky a little bit um, and depends on the conservation management goals here. One could definitely make an argument that there are three 
management units following the clustering solution and admixture proportions, but we have to recognize that many of the localities have ancestry from more than one of those clusters. Um, alternatively, again, depending on our goals, the hydrological units themselves could be the focus of management activities. Um, so I think there's real um, room for discussion about how to deal with the management unit questions here. With that, I'd like to thank some people. There's a whole lot of people that helped with field work beyond what Pete, Paul, and Ruben have contributed to this project. Uh, we also are very keenly interested in thanking the landowners who have graciously allowed access to their um, properties for collections here and discussions um, with various folks, many folks, in fact. Um, funding for this project specifically came from, as Paul noted at the beginning, the Texas Conservation License Plate funding from TPWD and from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and the lab funding in general also comes from National Science Foundation. And with that, thanks for tuning in. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Well, that was great, Chris. Thank you very much. There were some questions in the chat, and if anybody has uh, questions that they've been waiting for, please now is the the time to enter them. Uh, okay, some some uh, comments. A couple of comments here. The uh, drift tree is interesting. Bendik et al. suggested that Stealth and Sharon. Uh, the caves, the sites on Camp Bullis, were hybrids between Latitans and Neonis. Uh, this says no. Interesting. So, uh, do, um, do you... so, so the the drift tree. It is interesting. I agree. The drift tree is not telling us exactly about all of the potential sources of admixture, right? I think that I think that in, in order to inspect that more carefully, we need to go look at those admixture. Portions, um, but you're but you're totally right in identifying um, that area around Camp Bolas as a place where interesting things are happening for sure. That is a place where there is admixture, putative hybrids, if you want to think about it that way, for sure. Uh, another question: Do the arrows point the same direction if we take into account hydrogeology and groundwater flow patterns? Ah, that's a great question. And we have not got that far to figure that out. So we're still sort of processing the results from that demographic modeling. Um, and whoever suggested that, I really appreciate that suggestion. We'll have to take a closer look at those kinds of issues. Um, what would the alternative hypothesis look like in the drift tree analysis? Ancestral polymorphism? Question mark there. Yep. Another great question. That so the. <clears throat> If, if that admixture that we saw in the clustering uh, solution with those bar plots, if that was strictly due to ancestral polymorphism, then we should see no evidence of migration events, and we should not see migration events increasing our ability to explain the allele frequency variance there. So the, so the drift tree would be the best explanatory tree and as we add migration events if under the scenario or the hypothesis that everything was really ancestral polymorphism that the addition of migration events should actually decrease our ability to explain that allele frequency variation um, and so because it went the opposite direction i'm making the inference here that in fact it's not ancestral polymorphism but really uh, a series of gene flow events in the history of those salamanders that's brilliant I hope I hope this is good because I can't see anybody and I can't tell if my answers are satisfying anyway. <laughs> you can't tell either, but nobody's putting any more comments in there. There's no like you know ferny faces or anything, so we're we're good. Okay. Um, okay. So, is the possibility of gene flow due to the occasional long distance disperser, or are we, or are there intervening populations that we don't know about? Do what do we know about maximum distance an adult could disperse? Yes, that is a very good question, and as a limitation, a uh, limitation of the study and a limitation of the sampling. So, despite this, the really extensive geographic sampling that we have here, there are still holes in that sampling. And we do not have sort of complete information that would be required to sort of think about intervening populations. So whether this is really, you know, perhaps isolated long distance sort of dispersal events or island hopping sort of events between intervening sites is really hard uh, to estimate here because we 
we're constrained by the fact that these organisms are groundwater obligate. They're living in springs and caves, and they're really just sort of hard to find and hard to collect. So that's a really good question. I, I don't know if I can speak um, to the dispersal abilities of these salamanders, though I think there are members of the audience who definitely could do that. Yeah, if anybody out there wants to comment on the dispersal capabilities, please please put something in the in the chat. Um, so, how do we think they're dispersing across the landscape? Does the does the Huck data provide us any insight on that? Yeah, that's another good. You guys are all full of great questions today. So, so the suspicion that I, at least I will admit to having is that they are definitely using the aquifer in a way that perhaps many of the other karst organisms, especially the invertebrates, are just not doing. And what I mean by that is that I, I'm pretty confident that the salamanders use much more of the aquifer than the karst invertebrates do, that the karst invertebrates are more confined to closer to spring openings than the salamanders. And some of the evidence for this, I'm sure people can talk about this in the audience too, but I remember stories that Andy Glusenkamp was telling me about putting, you know, traps down in wells 400 feet down into the aquifer and catching these guys, not the blind ones, but the actual surface forms, which, you know, anecdotally suggests that, in fact, these salamanders do use the aquifer as a conduit for moving around. Um, it's sort of hard to imagine. You know, one of, one of the one of the things that's we're really interested in is understanding that underground architecture of the aquifer to really sort of figure out all these questions about how these organisms use that environment. Um, and that one's just a really good one. Um, whether the watersheds are going to be helpful on us figuring that out, I think remains to be seen. Yeah, Andy actually posted a comment in there about the, the well um, mm -hmm. example there. So good, good stuff. Um... Have you considered using stable isotopes of oxygen to to better distinguish water sources? Stable <laughs> isotopes might offer better resolution of potential movement corridors than watersheds. Well, that that's a, that's another great comment. So that's a conversation that I've actually had with my colleague and hydrologist Benjamin Schwartz. Um, you know, back to this idea of trying to understand. Um, you know, the movement of these individuals and that sort of architecture of that karst environment. We, we've been kind of, you know, really with this project and other projects related to it with other karst organisms, we've been trying to infer the patterns of gene exchange as a sort of proxy for the pathways in the aquifer. Um, the dye studies that have been done, while pretty interesting, seem to add more confusion in my mind than clarity to that issue. And it has been suggested, in fact, I think Benjamin Schwartz suggested this to me, um, that maybe we should do isotope data, that there's enough isotope oxygen, as you say, um, variation in the water that we could detect different sources, that that might be a really good way to sort of add information to the pathways that these organisms might be using. I think that's a great, great plan. Very cool. And then the last question uh, on the list so far is, how much is known about the groundwater connections in these areas? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, surprisingly little. <laughs> so, spoken like a true non-geologist. Um, frankly, it's frustrating. Um, somehow I think we should know more about it, but the fact is that the, that the aquifer is a very complicated, the karst business is a very complicated structure and, and relatively impenetrable at a fine scale. I think there's a lot more to be learned about the karst itself, about the aquifers themselves. Um, and again, we're sort of hoping that the compilation of studies like this one and studies of other karst dwelling organisms might all stack up to help us think about that particular question, like what's actually going on underground. But frankly, it's frustrating at this point, given how many you know, organisms of conservation concern are associated with the karst environments in this part of the world. It's frustrating how little we actually understand about the potential pathways for organisms to move. That's the best I can do with that. That's great. Well, somebody asked a question that was bound to come up at some point here, Chris. Uh, from this evidence, would you suggest these three species names should be synonymized? <laughs> um, can I punt on that? <laughs> Hey man, it's your webinar. We can, you can, you can well, plead the fifth. I, 
I have thought about this a lot, and I did expect this question for sure. And I think it's a legitimate one in a in a grand way. Um, I would point out that the amount of differentiation here is really low, and that the boundaries among the clusters are quite fuzzy given all of the admixture that appears to be happening. Um, so while we can sort of identify with our clustering al algorithm, we can identify three clusters, their boundaries are not sharp, which means that these taxa have had an enormous amount of gene flow um, in their history, which I guess if I put my evolutionary biologist hat on and I claim that the biological species concept is the concept that we should be using, then this strongly suggests that these salamanders are not reproductively isolated from each other and a better description of them might be something less than species status for those three. But I think I said at the beginning, there's a lot more people who know a lot more about salamanders than I do. So I'm going to leave it at that. That's okay. It looks like some of those people agree with your assessment there. <laughs> um, and uh, there's another comment, I think, about uh, how the sort of organization of the hydrogeology here. I think it's Chad Norris. He says, I tend to think of the gravity fed or elevated portions of the Trinity and Edwards aquifers as being more fragmented than the Artesian Edwards. While there are large sections that may still be hydrologically connected, there are also sections that are isolated. I think that's right on spot, and I and and we have a little bit more exploring to do to sort of tackle that question with the with this particular group of salamanders. I think that I think in in many respects that idea um, was also the idea, at least at some level, behind the bigger survey of genomic variation that the Devitt et al. paper recently uncovered. Um, there, they were also sort of attributing um, the major patterns of variation to major watersheds as well, but I think that that kind of aquifer elevation and connectivity as a function of elevation in the aquifer is a really good place to continue looking for um, essentially predictors of genetic variation in these guys, and that's something that we are continuing to work on. That's a great one. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. 